Amen. You may be seated. What will heaven be like? What awaits for those who get there, and should it be something we anticipate? I suppose with the amount of thinking and meditating on heaven that most of us do, the quick answer would be to that question, what will heaven be like, would be, who cares? Or for some, earth but a little better. Or if you grew up in my tradition, it will be filled with harp playing and singing and When I was a child, neither of those thrilled me all that much. Will all our friends be there? Will family be what we first and foremost notice? If you have paid attention at all to some of the books that have come out, I suppose, in the last 10, 15 years, you have seen people who believe they traveled to heaven and came back. I'm not doubting their belief. I am doubting the reality of their stories. For almost all of them go and come back and talk about wonderful things, but in those wonderful things, most, if not all, I suppose I have not read all of them, lose sight of the glory of what heaven will actually be like. When we study our Bibles, what we discover is that for those who know Jesus, for those who delight in Him, believe in Him, trust in Him, want to live for Him, heaven becomes one of the things we are most fixated upon. There's good reason for this, although I suppose in the history of the Canadian church it hasn't been quite as evident, but the reason for this is that earth is not our home. For those who are truly devoted to Jesus, earth is actually a difficult place. It's a place where we're outsiders, where we don't quite fit in, where our standards, our way of thinking is so different from the world, so filled with holiness and self-sacrificial love that we don't quite fit in. And so what motivates us in the midst of the brokenness in this fallen world, at least in the history of the church, has been a longing for heaven, a heaven that is better by far. And I think one of the things that would awaken the Canadian church to live fully for Jesus, not be distracted or disoriented or divided, is a a new feeling for the glory of heaven. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope that you do, if you could open them with me to the book of Revelation, we're in Revelation chapter 21, where we have a picture of heaven. We don't find out a lot of the details of heaven because I suppose it's so different from what we are currently experiencing on earth. I've been asked this week, will there be golf in heaven? And my answer is no, but if you feel most satisfied on the golf course, then perhaps that's as close to understanding and experiencing heaven as you will get. I hope that's not where you feel most satisfied. See, when we start to understand heaven, when we start to comprehend it, we realize it's incomprehensible. And you might say, well, pastor, that's a contradiction. You you just said we want to understand it, and then you've told us it's not understandable. When the Apostle Paul went to heaven, he comes back and explains what happened to him, and he was forbidden from sharing with others, perhaps because it was impossible, but for sure because there was a pride that came with what was to come, and he was given, 2 Corinthians 12 tells us, a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble and fully devoted and dependent on God. Perhaps the greatest picture of heaven that is given in the Bible is found in the book of Revelation. And I'll remind you that in Revelation, the details that are given are given so that we will feel, so that we will experience. They're they're given in a picturesque way so that our reality is shifted. Not just so we'll understand what is to come, but so that we'll live in light of it. Remember with me, if you will, we've been out of this book for a few weeks, and so... 
It's important we understand in the context of Revelation what this teaches because it is truly life transforming if we'll understand it that this is a book that is about Jesus. The Holy Spirit has given it to us so that we'll live all of life in light of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done and what is to come guaranteed in the Bible in the midst of a broken world. It shows us a Jesus who is glorious, who walks among the churches, who knows us, is personal, and it shows us the future that is to come so that no matter what we're going through, we live in light of that future, confident in Jesus, at peace and rest, even as we live our lives with passion for his glory. It shows us churches that are struggling. In fact, name seven of them, literal churches. And as the letter was carried to them, the message for them was become those who are overcomers. Become those who live life as if God is real and relevant because he is real and relevant. Don't don't get caught up in your culture. Get caught up in Christ. We need this message as bad as the early churches did. We need this message because the world we live in is not our home. There was a coronation of a king yesterday. Were you aware of that? Harry went but stayed out of the pomp and pageantry. Now you're up to date on all of the gossip I know. (laughs) But it's a reminder for us of the one who is truly king. There is someone who reigns. And we can know him personally. And Jesus is coming again. And the throne is real. And Revelation 21, 22 gives us an entry point into seeing and experiencing and feeling what this eternity is like. Not just so that we go, wow, heaven is awesome. But so that in light of this beatific vision of the glory and majesty of Jesus and the place where he is, we will live in light of it. This This is a picture that is given to us to change how we live. If you see what John would have you see, I suppose even more importantly, substantially more importantly, if you experience what the Holy Spirit wants you to experience as you glimpse in this passage the glory of Jesus, the wonder of heaven, and the delight we will have there together, the things that will be missing, the things that will be there then we will become so heavenly minded that we are of some earthly good. When you track through a passage like this, it will be easy as it has been with the entire book of Revelation to be distracted by details. And what I mean by that is, this is not a book that's given to us for didactic, logical, sequential teaching. It's a book given to us so that we'll experience, so that we'll see, so that we'll respond. One of the great mistakes of the church about 50 years ago, and maybe 100 years ago to 50 years ago, somewhere in that, is they got so caught up in the details, they missed the delight we can have in Christ and the hope we can have in eternity. They got so caught up in charts and graphs that they forgot that Jesus is real and heaven is real and we should live in light of those things for his glory. And this thing that is to come is not about the details of what will be there, but rather the delight that we get to be there with Jesus. I think the details are important but secondary. So I want to ask three questions of the text, and I hope answer them in such a way that our understanding, let's deepen that, our experience of heaven with this book will be such that every person here that knows Jesus will say, I want to live in light of eternity. I want to be so eternally focused that everything else is secondary. So the first question I want us to ask is this, what is there to look forward to? And I want to read with you the first eight verses. We have, up to this point in Revelation, read every verse. We've done that on purpose because the book promises a blessing to those who read it. We'll try to do the same here, but I want to start with the first eight verses. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice the different pictures. The same thing, but different understandings so that we will grasp and experience the glory of what is happening. 
And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. If you underline, highlight, star, that verse is the center, maybe of the entire book of Revelation, certainly of what we're going to learn about heaven. Now we find some things that aren't there. We'll get into that in just a minute. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. The fall is gone. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. Conquer, reference back. Especially you see this in Greek, but you can see it in English as well. Same word for overcome. To those in those seven churches, to those in history who conquer, who are overcomers. Who have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Heaven is real. He's making all things new. And and this is important for us to understand because it gives us an anticipation without so many... Confusing things that might make us think that if this is just a place of harps and singing, maybe we don't even want to go there. I've been asked before if pets will be in heaven, and I think it's a legitimate question, but let me, let me say this in light of pets and people. What have you noticed so far in this text? It's not that there aren't other people there. I don't actually think pets will be in heaven but there will be animals. It's not that there's not other people there. There are other people there. But what do you notice exclusively as we enter into this experience of heaven? You notice God. You notice God. You notice God. In fact, you notice him so exclusively that now in light of who he is and what he has done, everything else is made new and fresh and right. Heaven is first and foremost and always the dominating presence of the living God with his people. And this should give us the greatest anticipation of going there. I heard a quote last week from another preacher, and I'm actually not in full agreement with this quote, but I think it's helpful to understand how important the presence of God is to heaven. He said, if you could have, he's quoting an early church father, if you could have heaven without God or hell with Jesus, the true believer would choose hell every time. Now, I'm uncomfortable with that quote for this reason. I don't think you can understand heaven without Jesus or Jesus without heaven. So I don't think it works, but I think the point of it is so helpful. The main focus, the main fixation, the main longing in the heart of those who want to be in heaven should be, must be, that intimacy we get with God. He will be there. He he will dwell with his people for all eternity. That is the, the shout out of this book. The greatest treasure in heaven is not its gold streets. You probably heard the joke, if you're saving up your gold now and you try to bring it into heaven, Peter will say to you, why are you bringing pavement into heaven? And yet the gold streets are not what makes heaven so attractional. It's the presence of a living God. And this passage shouts out, and I've read it to you, but now let me break it down a little bit. Who who is this God? It's not like he hasn't already told us throughout the entire book of Revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. But notice some things about this one whom we long to go see. He is loving. Verse 2, there's this comparison. The church is the bride of Christ. Who's the groom? This passage tells us, although you probably know this intuitively, it's the Lamb. There's a love and intimacy that can only be seen on earth in a marriage relationship. Now, something we have with the living God. He loves his church. He loves me. 
The bride is occupied this place, this city. It's used interchangeably, all Christians throughout all time. But there'll be a love relationship with the living God, a tenderness, an intimacy, a choosing of the best. If you have ever, and if you're human, you have, perhaps even if you're not aware of it, felt unlovable or unloved, lonely or alone, then as you look to heaven, realize this hope is that the living God will so be there and so display that he is love that you will be filled, Ephesians 3 would say, to the fullness of God. Heaven is the dwelling place of God and his people. And this text says he is loving, he is personal, he is, as verse 3 states, our God. I suppose this is obvious because we celebrate this, but it's worth emphasizing. We experience his presence as one who is for us, who, who loves us. Romans 8.32 says we can experience that now when it's so confusing because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Because the Father sent the Son. He did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him freely, graciously give us all things? We, we know here in absolute security because of his love. But there we don't even need that as a security. We rest in it as a reality. In fact, the closer we are to God, the more we experience the richness of his love and of his life, and this intimacy is beyond anything we've experienced here. It's personal, it's corporate, and it's powerful. Thirdly, he's not only loving and personal, he is all-powerful or powerful. He is seated on the throne. He is the ruler. As you probably remember as we've walked through this book, when you sit on the throne, it means that there's nothing you're scared of. There's no one that can take it away from you. There's this absolute authority. He is the ruler. He is the sovereign one. He is worthy of our worship and full surrender. Oh, that we would see him now seated on the throne and allow that vision of his rulership govern how we respond to life when it feels sometimes so chaotic. Verse 5, again, he is faithful, trustworthy, and true. Everything he has promised is sure, sometimes in the language, even in this text, as if it had already occurred because it's so sure that it will he is faithful. He will never let his children down. You see why the presence of God and the power of God in all of eternity is so precious? He is the Alpha and Omega. He's eternal. I suppose this has been a theme of the entire book, but here it's more than just the beginning and the end. It's the one whom all things were made through and for, kind of that Colossians echoing. Yes, he's the beginning. Yes, he's the end. Yes, he is eternal. He is over all things. But now, this idea that not only is his knowledge comprehensive, his wisdom knows no fault. Every decision, every allowance is right and good. But now we know also that we exist for him. Now, every breath that we take for his glory, satisfied in him, that's where we go. He's all satisfying this purpose, passion, significance, security, all rests in him. And he's... He's the one who's the spring of living water, verse 6. Harder maybe for us to understand who turn on taps and have fresh water that doesn't poison us. But for these people reading this, this is so important. Fresh water, satisfying, hot day. You, you can't hardly breathe. Your, your throat is constriction because it's dry. And then you taste the water and it satisfies and frees. And this is this endless spring of living water that causes all of our needs to be met in him fully and complete. I don't know about you, but if you've had a tough week ever, if you had a tough week last week, and you feel like you fall short, you feel like life around you isn't fair, you feel like others maybe are letting you down, or jobs, or ministries, or life, or what, whatever the case may be, this is this promise of full and complete satisfaction. No peace can be stolen from you there. No anxiety allowed there. Full freedom and rest and satisfaction. He's glorious. Skipping ahead to verses 22 to 23, which we didn't read. 
And you could include verse 11 in this as well. But heaven itself will reflect the glory of God. It's amazing. The most precious, powerful, and prevailing thing about heaven is the presence of God. And it is sad for me that when we talk about heaven, almost always this is not primary. If anything, it's secondary. Primary would be the things we treasure on earth, whether satisfactions or other relationships. My challenge from this book for you is if you want to be one who is prepared for heaven, the best way is to now deepen your relationship with Jesus. Devote your life completely to him. Get to know him better. Get to love him more. Live for him with all your might in the midst of the pain and confusion and turmoil. Because if you live for him now, then in his presence you will experience this glorious delight in him that will never, ever go away. Now it's interesting when it talks about the presence of Jesus, the presence of God in heaven being the main thing, that now as the text tries to explain to us a little bit more of the physical place of heaven, and heaven is a physical place that we will inhabit as those who know him, and we're going to talk about how do we get there, It's interesting to me that as he describes this, often it's with the negative, what's not there. Again, I want to run through this relatively rapidly so that we can stay fixated on the main point, which is the hope we have in us. But what is not there? What what can we look forward to getting rid of? And I just want to run through this again very quickly. I'm taking this from a message that Charles Swindoll preached, although it's straight from the text, and then I'll expand it a little bit. No more sea in heaven. Some of you will be very disappointed. I know for Lori, her dream would be a beach house overlooking the beach. And then for my sake, she'd include a little mountains in the scenery behind. And that would be heaven for her. Well, I understand that. But you remember, for these people, heaven would not contain a sea. Because sea was a symbol of brokenness. A symbol of the fall, of chaos, of confusion, of destruction. So when it says this, don't, again, remember with the apocalyptic literature, it's giving us a picture of what would be there. And what it's saying when it says no more sea, perhaps there'll be water there or not. It's saying no more brokenness, no more consequences of the fall, no more earth groaning, if you want to use Romans chapter 8 language. This is really from Isaiah, the end parts of Isaiah, but this idea that there'll be full and complete healing of everything in creation and beyond. Verse 4, no more tears. If sometimes you think of things that are hurtful or pain you're going through now, all swallowed up in eternity, replaced by joy. No more death because mortality will be swallowed up. Verse 4, no more mourning because sorrow will be completely comforted. No more crying, verse 4. You wonder why... The Holy Spirit saw to put all of those there. I think I could have just summed it up with one word. But here's the thing. In a broken world, we will experience pain, will we not? I had the privilege of being with someone who has given hours to live this week. And after showing me how to improve my golf swing, he talked about his looking forward to eternity. And we cried a little together. But when he gets there ahead of me, I think, his pain will be over. All suffering will be cured. No more thirst, verse 6, because God graciously will quench every desire. We talked about this already. There'll be a full satisfaction. You know that longing that's in you sometimes? You, you wake up and you go, I just, I just want something more. I want to give more. I want to be more. I want to, I want to accomplish something. I, I want to use... I, I, Gone. Rest. No more thirst. No more wickedness. Of all of them, I've circled this one. This is my favorite. No more struggle with sin in your own life. No more pain. All evil will be banished. All sin gone. No impurities. No more thirst. No more wickedness. No more temple. What is that talking about? You see in later detail the 
cube that is the temple, referring back, we all think, to the Holy of Holies, the intimacy with God. You don't, you don't need a temple because the Father and the Son are personally present and the Spirit is there. And we are guided in, in a powerful way to never need any sort of intermediary. No more night because God's glory will give eternal light. His glory on display that we can see and live in light of in a perfect manner. No more closed gates. This is verse 25, which we didn't read. Closed gates. Why do you close your gates? Because there might be an enemy that might sneak in. That there might be some danger that is outside of the city, and so you wall in the city, and there will be walls in this city, but you wall it in so that you can keep out those who might cause you danger. You don't need gates in heaven. There is no fear. No more curse. This is in chapter 22, verse 3, because Christ's blood has forever lifted that curse. And now what we look forward to is what will be there, a reality that we experience and nothing can take that experience from us. Listen, I want you and me to long to be in heaven because there the intimacy with Jesus will be complete, that intimacy with God, that understanding and experience of his presence, that satisfaction in him all of the time, that's what we should long for the most. But, but if that's not enough, see all of the things that are negative and hurtful disappear. There's something new, brand new. Oh, we can't understand it fully now, even though there's attempts of pictures of it, but we can understand everything and anything negative is gone. So thirdly, how do we get there? How, how do we get there? So if the first question that we asked, which was perhaps the most important, pointed us to Jesus, what is there to look forward to? And then we said, well, what is not there? And it's really anything negative. And then we say, okay, then how do we get there? And verse 8 tells us who is not there, and it outlines a number of sins. Some have looked at this and said, see, there's a work salvation. There's, there's a, a standard you need to meet to get into heaven. And let me answer that question with the simple, that's actually true. There is a standard you have to meet to get into heaven. Do you know what the standard is? Perfection. Some of you said, Jesus, that's the right answer. It's always the right answer in church. <laughs> Perfection. And, and why was Jesus the right answer? Because the only way we can be good enough to get into heaven is to have our lives clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Amen? Amen? And that always changes us. See, the grace that saves is a grace that transforms. And God's grace that shows us how glorious He is and causes us to believe in Him and respond in faith and to choose to surrender to Him fully then allows us to live our lives for His glory. And so the the Bible can rightly say heaven will not have people who practice this, but only people who practice this. Not meaning you get into heaven by works, outside of the works of Jesus, but meaning when you have experienced Jesus' works, you surrender to him as king, as Lord, and your life is changed. One of my favorite authors has a book on saving faith, an excellent book. And he writes this, For centuries, theologians have assumed that saving faith includes more than the confidence that Christ is competent, like the lecherous sermon. When the three traditional descriptions of faith were used, there was an assumption that the word fiducia, cordial trust, alongside notitia, knowledge, and assertion of mental assent, included more than trusting Jesus as just Jesus, an effective rescuer from hell, but actually receiving Jesus as our supreme treasure. Now, I want us to notice in light of what we've already learned, in light of the context, what I think Piper is saying there, and that is this. When you truly believe in Jesus, he becomes your greatest treasure. That's why heaven, the anticipation for heaven, your greatest anticipation is to be with Jesus. Your greatest passion now is to live for Jesus. That is what saving faith is. It's believing what he has done for us, treasuring him as our greatest treasure, and responding to him then with open hands saying, here I am, send me. And so the evaluation that is given in this text of those who will not be in heaven and those who will be, 
does not remove the need of faith. It just shows us what saving faith is. And that is something that we believe, a worldview that shifts everything else. And then someone we follow with all of our might. Oh, yes, broken. And we fall short, but we follow. So back to the question, how can we make sure we're there? And this book, Revelation, tells us we need to make sure that our names are written in the book of life. We, we need to make sure that we know the God of the Bible the way he has said he wants to be known. We need to be those who are Christians. We need to be those who believe. Not, not just an assent of the mind, but a confession of the heart. So I suppose as we anticipate heaven, the greatest treasure of heaven being the intimacy that is open and complete with God, as we look at all of the consequences of the fall that will be removed and being with the people of God throughout history in his presence for his glory, as we look at that and we anticipate that with great joy, the question we need to ask is, are we now confessing that Jesus is Lord, believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead so that we will be saved, marked, and put in the book of life. Revelation 3, 5, 20, 12, it's here in our text. Philippians 4, verse 3, marked because of our faith in his grace for his glory, turning from sin to the living God. So I suppose if we talk about this, do you have a correct sight of heaven? This chapter wants you to see it. Oh, it gets into all sorts of amazing things. Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Come, I will show you heaven. Now remember, he's already said what is greatest about heaven is the presence of Jesus. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, the radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal, probably a poor translation because they didn't here have the technology to make crystal clear, probably just shining, sparkling. Think, think in your mind of just this, this beautiful, majestic display of light. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and the 12 gates angels. And on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes, the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, were three gates. On the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Probably the foundations in terms of how we know him and the gospel. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square in its length, same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia, his length and width and height are equal. Lots of people go into why that's so big and how many people will fit there. Listen, I don't think that's the point. This is a picture of the holy of holies. This is a majestic picture of the presence of God. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the walls of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnidian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth hurl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophorus, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Listen, I, I think this is somewhat like it will look, but that's not the point of this passage. The point of this passage is going to be so glorious that it should shape how you think and feel and live now. Because Jesus is there and because everything is then a reflection of the intimacy we have with him and it will be shining and beautiful. And I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it. The glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. But its light will be, will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Lots of questions on that. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there'll be no night there. They'll bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So I have some questions to apply this. And I hope 
really driving home two main concerns. First, make sure your name is written in the book of life. Second, live in light of eternity. Here are my implications. First one, be so heavenly minded that you are some earthly good. Be so heavenly minded that you are some earthly good. This book is written to Christians who are suffering. The emperor who is just about to come on the throne, we know this from history, is going to bring about a vicious persecution of Christians. Notice here there's no political fighting. There's no stand up for your rights. There's anticipate heaven. There's this passion to say, know the presence of God and live in light of this. Be so heavenly minded. Understand your citizenship is there that everything else becomes secondary and your passion is to get there and you know that is gain. To live is Christ. To die is... Listen to Colossians 3, how it puts it here. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's the picture of Revelation 21. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You get the point? It's not hard to get, it's just hard to do. Make your passionate focus eternity, your fixation Jesus. Allow everything else to come in line with those two things. Be so heavenly minded that you're some earthly good. This means you'll serve the bride. You know, we're doing this conference, the church is essential. That's, that's the whole point. That this is the great joy we have in serving Jesus. We'll serve in the local church. We'll, we'll love her. We'll devote our lives to God. We'll, we'll have a priority saying, I want to know him and love him and love his people and be humble and filled with a passion regardless of the cost of helping others to know him and follow him. Be so heavenly minded that when distractions come, no matter how severe, and for these people reading this book for the first time, the distractions are coming and they're intense. Listen, I think they're no less intense in the pleasures that Canada has had for so long or the pains that perhaps are to come. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Secondly, see trials in light of eternity. See, trials in light of eternity. If you don't do this, you'll either have a pity party or you'll fight. Pity party, poor me. It's the worm song I've taught you before. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Think I'll go to the garden and eat another worm. See, when you think in light of eternity, you you can't sing that song. Or... You'll fight. My rights, my views, my life. You know, it's interesting in Philippians 1, and I've been spending a lot of time meditating on that. I'll share a little bit more with you at different times. In fact, it's the talk I'm going to give at the gospel is essential conversation. But Paul there is about to die. He's had Christians who preach making fun of him and saying he doesn't belong. They're, they're cutting his legs out from under him in terms of his ministry. And he, he's in a Roman cell and he's chained to a Roman guard and he thinks he might die. And he says, to, to live as Christ, to die is gain. I've quoted that to you. But you know, then he goes on to say, I think I'm going to stay here because I want to continue to suffer for your good. Can you believe Paul's mentality? I want to go to heaven. I want to be with Jesus. I want, I want that better to depart and be with him by far. But I think I'm going to stay on earth and continue to suffer because I think God's plan for me to build a church isn't done. I want to feel that way and live that way and experience that because I treasure Jesus so much. Listen, if we understand John and Jesus and Paul then we can say, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Amen? Whew, it's heavy. Most importantly, today, treasure Jesus above everything else. There are some of you here who have been raised in the church and think you're Christians but have never truly treasured Jesus. I'm hoping this is a wake-up call for you. I needed this when I was 18, 19, 20, somewhere in there. We all need this. But especially if you're here and you look at your life and you say, well, I've said the prayer, I've, I've 
walk to the front, the sawdust trail, if you want to use church history's use of it. I went forward to Billy Graham crusade, maybe if you're a little older, whatever it is. Christianity is about true faith in him. The only way to spend eternity in heaven is to have that faith in him. To, to say, it's a mental ascent, it's a will that is given over, and then it's a life that is lived. To say in faith, I believe Jesus is real. I believe that Jesus came and lived on the cross, lived a life that was perfect, died on the cross, and rose again, conquering sin and death. I believe that I fall short of his glory, and my sins are given to him and his righteousness to me. And if that's a mental ascent that leads to a will that is given over, that will lead to a life that is lived for him, and you will become one, not perfectly, but growing, who treasures Jesus above everything else. Revelation is about the future, but it's about the future so that our present will be lived for him and the purification of his bride. When I first started this journey with you through the book of Revelation, I was a little bit nervous because there's so much here that I am growing in my understanding of, and when you preach, you want to preach with the sureness of the word of God. But what I have discovered as we come close to the end, is that what the Spirit has made plain is so life-transforming that if we grasp it, we'll never be the same. Do you see heaven? As defined by Revelation 21? Can you take that and see your trials in light of eternity so that you can then count it pure joy when you suffer? And are you growing in treasuring Jesus now and for eternity above anything and everything else? That will change your life, this church, and eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of Revelation and for this picture that you gave to John and to us and to churches throughout history. Thank you for the privilege we have of seeing you, Lord Jesus, and seeking in the midst of our blindness and aches and pains to treasure you and to anticipate with hope and surety the future that you have promised. Would you help us to live in light of eternity and to treasure you, Lord Jesus, above everything and anything else? Forgive us for when we fall short in our full devotion. Give us the faith to believe and to cling and to shape our lives around you. If there are those here that don't know you, would you give them this treasuring you? And for those of us that do, would you cleanse us from distractions, disorientations, and divisions and cause us to delight in you above everything else. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.